Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We hope you're having a wonderful Tuesday. We're just going to give everybody a second here to log on and get into the, the panel discussion here. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing an update on the FLASH uh, clinical trial. So we're really excited. We have a really excellent panel here today to discuss this for you. Um, in case you're not aware, FLASH is a potential new treatment for early stage cutaneous lymphoma using a visible fluorescent light. Um, so we'll hear a lot more about that in just a minute. We would just like to really quick thank our corporate partners and our individual donors. Without you, these programs would absolutely not be possible. So thank you for your continued support. Today we have a wonderful panel. We have the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation's very own Susan Thornton, our CEO. She's down there in the bottom. We also have Ellen Kim. She's the medical director of the dermatology clinic at the Perelman Center for Advanced Medicine. Uh, we have Dr. Chris Bouillon, medical director for Sologenics, and Dr. Richard Straub, the chief medical officer for Sologenics. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're really grateful for your time. Uh, we have a pretty uh, outlined agenda here for you, and I'm going to turn things over to Susan to get us started. Great. Thanks, Hillary. And for those of you who haven't met Hillary in the past, Hillary is our program manager and makes all these wonderful programs happen behind the scenes. So um, as I always say, I just get to look good out in front. <laughs> and all the real magic happens be behind, behind the closed doors. Um, so we're really excited to be here today. And uh, for many of you, if you've been following us, we have been watching uh, the FLASH clinical trial unfold over the last many years. We did an initial industry spotlight uh, with uh, Dr. Straub back in early 2017, and then we did a follow-up kind of uh, with the trial and where it was at that point in time with Dr. Kim in early 2018. So now here we are to give you all an update on the FLASH trial and where we are and what's happening. And uh, I think it's, it's pretty exciting to have gotten to this point. And as many of you may know, if you've done any studying of the clinical trial process from kind of preclinical early stage all the way through when uh, a new treatment is actually approved, by the FDA here in the US or the European um, Medicines Agency in Europe, you know, that whole process can take something along the lines of 10 years. And many clinical trials never make it even to the later stages of the uh, phases to become an actual treatment. So, so the reality is for a therapy to get as far as, as this one is with the FLASH trial is very, very exciting, especially in a rare disease. Uh, you know, as many of you may know, it's, uh, there's not a lot always treatments and clinical trials happening in the rare disease world. And we're very fortunate in the arena of clinical trial to, uh, to have this one coming so far. So really excited to have a chance to share with you what's happening, where we are, and uh, kind of a little, a little visibility into what happens next and what we can look forward to. So what I thought I'd do is I'd turn it over to Dr. Chris Poulion to give us a little bit of a background, kind of for those of you who may not be familiar with the FLASH trial, maybe you uh, heard a little bit about it or you know nothing about it, give us a background so we're all on the same page and then we can go from there and uh, talk a little bit more about what's happening and, and what we've learned. So Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. That's a, that's a nice segue uh, to bring us up. First, welcome, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity partnering with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation over the years uh, for patient education and awareness has been a fantastic experience. I think you guys are a great organization, so thank you again for everything that you do. Um, just I'll try to summarize uh, briefly over a decade's worth of uh, research into a short segment here as, as succinctly as I can. Uh, like you said, it, it starts with safety. I mean, the first thing that they do is they have an idea. Hyperacin, the active ingredient that we're studying in the FLASH trial of the ointment, uh, is a known photoreactive compound. Um, the first thing that they did uh, was they looked at it in the context of animal studies um, to make sure that there didn't seem to be anything that would be an indication that wasn't okay to go on to safety trials in humans. 
Uh, once it clears that, it goes into phase one studies, which are healthy volunteers. And what they're doing now is they're taking the ointment, um, the synthetic hypericin, and they're, they're pa placing it on different areas of the patient's skin in different concentrations, and they're exposing it to different types of light. The biggest takeaway that we got one away from the phase one study, first off, was that it was safe. Um, there was no clinical indication that it was not prudent to move forward to later stages of development, but also that it was maximally affected and uh, caused to be affected by fluorescent light, which is very different if you're familiar with phototherapy in this landscape. When we talk about phototherapy, we normally talk about ultraviolet light. Um, in this context, hypericin is activated more by fluorescent light, um, which is very interesting. And they also honed in on the exact concentration that they wanted to use. So then some intelligent people, uh, predominantly Dr. Alan Rook at the University of Pennsylvania and Madeline Duvick at MD Anderson and Gary Wood at Cleveland Clinic, put together a phase two trial design uh, and where they would test this in areas where they thought they could take advantage of uh, the photoreactivity uh, for their patients. And they tested it in both uh, warts, psoriasis, and CTCL. Um, didn't really have much effect at all in warts, but it was statistically significant and effective in both psoriasis and CTCL. And obviously CTCL being such a, a large focus of their interest and in research in the time, and due to the overwhelming lack of therapies uh, that, that they had available, they really thought it was worthwhile uh, you know, uh, driving this forward. And that's basically where we come in. Uh, when you have positive research, uh, design, the, the first thing that you want to do is, is basically prove it again. You want to take uh, that signal. You want to make sure that you do indeed get a clear-cut answer of yes or no, do I have a drug effect? And that is what this phase three study, the FLASH trial that we're talking about today, was explicitly designed to do. Um, we ran this throughout the entire country, all around the United States. We had it at about 30 centers. Overall, we enrolled 169 patients, which is a pretty large um, study. And one of the things that I'm happiest with was we were able to control this with a placebo control, which again is also somewhat rare if you look at uh, how other therapies have been developed for cutaneous lymphoma patients. Um, the trial design was pretty straightforward and simple. Again, we're trying to get to a yes, no answer. Does the drug work? Uh, the way we did that was we broke it up into three cycles. And the main difference between the cycles was what are we treating and with what? Um, First cycle was our primary efficacy point of the study. Um, each cycle was eight weeks long. And basically what we did was your, the treating physician would, at the hospital, would, would examine the patient. They would select three index lesions that they thought were most representative of the patient's lymphoma. Um, they would have them put the ointment on at home 18 to 24 hours beforehand, and they would come into the trial and get their therapy. Um, the therapy would be two times a week for six weeks. They would take a rest period during week seven. And then at week eight, they would compare how the patient did on those three index lesions at week eight compared to how they were when they started the trial at what we call baseline. Um, and again, remember, the difference is what you're treating them with what. So in cycle one, we had our control, which was the placebo. It was a randomization ratio of two to one, which means that for every two patients that came into the trial that got study drug, one person got placebo. Um, and then, like I said, they were evaluated at week eight. After week eight, cycle one was over. We now go into cycle two. The difference between cycle one and cycle two is the what you're treating with. In this phase, every patient's getting treated with active drug. So the patients that got placebo in cycle one are now getting active drug for the first time. And the patients that got active drug the first time are getting it again um, to see if an additional course of therapy is effective. Um, but the rest of the treatment schedule is exactly the same. They put the ointment on 18 to 24 hours beforehand at home. They come into the clinic the next day. They see their staff. They get the phototherapy. Typically, this phototherapy was lasting somewhere in the range of four to 12 minutes. Um, it depended on where you were in the study because those of you that are familiar with phototherapy know that we normally titrate the dose up. Okay, so you start at a low dose, make sure you can tolerate it, and you kind of keep going up until you see a desired effect. 
again, six weeks, they took the seventh week off. The eighth week was again, the evaluation time point. And again, at this time point, you're comparing it not only back to baseline, the first time that they were seen, but also how they compared against how they did at the end of cycle one. Then we come to cycle three. And cycle three was completely optional. It was basically a compassionate use study for our patients. If the physicians thought that this was a, a good opportunity for the patients to see some true effect in their disease, and they were getting some resolution, and if the patient thought that, hey, this is working, I like this, I'm tolerating this well, and I think I'm seeing a good effect, um, they could opt to go into cycle three. And this is much more of a real world use. So again, back to the difference of, you know, what you're treating them with what. Here, everyone's still using active drug again. So then this is the second or third time these patients have gotten an opportunity to, to use SGX301 synthetic hyperacin, um, but they also get to use it in a more real world context. So instead of just three index lesions, now what they're doing is they're treating any and all areas of disease that they wish um, on their body. And it's completely voluntary. If they don't think it's uh, worthwhile for them and they don't want to do it, they go right into the follow-up stage. But if they think that it's having uh, a benefit and they would like to participate, uh, they, they could participate. And what I thought was encouraging, and I know we, we talked about this with other investigators on the, on the trial, is we had around 70% of our patients uh, opt to go into the cycle three study. Now, many of you are those patients um, and you know that uh, you participated in research trials and you know that um, to, to take on the commitment to come into the clinic for, for an additional two months when you don't have to, um, is not a small ask. So thank you very much for that because we got some, you know, some, some great response out of that. Um, but also I think it's indicative of, of just overall, you know, how well it was tolerated and what the, the perception was of, uh, of the trial in the, in the clinic and, and with the patients. Um, but they treated the same schedule. They treated uh, six weeks. They would put the ointment on before, two times a week, the seventh week they had off, and then at week eight, they would evaluate how they were doing at that time point, which is now several months later, to how they did at baseline, how they did at the end of cycle one, and how they did at the end of cycle two. Um, and then we go into the long-term follow-up phase. So that's kind of where we are right now. We just wrapped up our last patients getting through the cycle three phase. Okay, so that data is all being cleaned, um, monitored. There's a lot that needs to go into getting the data prepared to then give to statisticians for analysis to then report to the public. Um, and in the meantime, all those patients are now in follow-up. And basically what we do for follow-up is they come into the clinic and they see their physician once a month uh, for six months. And they're looking at duration of response, they're looking at um, safety, they're looking at um, you know, how well everything is being tolerated and they're doing other things like taking photographs and labs and, and things like that. And that continues for six months until we're at the end of the trial. So that's where we are today. I don't wanna to steal too much of Dr. Kim's thunder and talk about how we, uh, how we did, but I can tell you that we've already analyzed uh, and reported the results as many of you have seen for cycle one and cycle two. Uh, it's great news. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kim. Yeah, great, great. And I'll just jump in here real quick. Um, Chris, thank you for that. And, and I think that was a great explanation of how this all went and what was specific to this particular trial. And I think very unique in that you actually did have a placebo arm initially that we usually don't have. Um, in, in our world. And it, I think this was just such a unique and different approach um, to the trial and to the treatment. And the fact that you enabled people after the first two kind of rounds to go into an optional uh, and be able to collect data again, maybe not as uh, structured as what is required within the, the clinical trial itself because clinical trials have to be so uh you know you can't go outside the lines you have the the um the structure that yes your protocol thank you and uh so being able to get some additional data on that follow-up i think is really really great so dr kim you were the principal investigator on this trial so maybe you can also give folks some appreciation of what does it mean to be a principal investigator? As Chris said, you know, they had a number of sites around the country. So the trial was actually being conducted at a lot of different 
uh, institutions and cutaneous lymphoma clinics uh, around the country, but, but you were the principal investigator um, here in my backyard at the University of Pennsylvania. So maybe give folks a sense of w what does that mean and, um, and then what is your role and then some appreciation for what you um, perceived going through the trial process and kind of along the way and anything that you might be able to share uh, from the patient's perspective um, would be great. I think it would be great to, to kind of hear the, the, the clinical side and, and someone that was deeply engaged in delivery of the trial. So I'll turn it over to you. I was lucky to um, be a colleague of Dr. Alan Rook. Um, his office is right next door to me right here. Um, and so he's, he was involved with the development of this, um, uh, this agent. Um, and uh, we use the term photodynamic therapy. So that's the terminology that dermatologists use to distinguish it as a therapy that um, combines phototherapy, the light therapy, with a photosensitizer and generally a topical photosensitizer, which is the hypericin that Dr. Pullian mentioned. Um, and so Dr. Rook was really excited about it. Um, it has a lot of really unique characteristics um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it in terms of mechanism of action, but because it uses this ultraviolet light Dr. Pullian mentioned, um, it doesn't have the same risks of uh, causing what we say is mutagenesis, so causing mutations in skin DNA that leads to skin cancer. So if I think most of the audience knows um, phototherapy, standard phototherapy, such as UVB or UVA therapy, um, if you have you know, hundreds of treatments over time, and some patients do need that, um, if you have fair skin, then your risk of skin cancer goes up. Uh, because of this mutagenic effect of the UVB and UVA photother um, phototherapy. But this uh, photodynamic therapy with hypericin and ultraviolet light doesn't have that. Um, it doesn't cause mutagenesis. It, it, it basically um, gets rid of the misbehaving malignant T cells and CTCL in a different way um, through reactive oxygen um, species generation. So the safety profile is, is really very good um, in a way that could be helpful for patients who have a history of skin cancer or who've been developing skin cancers from phototherapy. So to talk a little bit about the trial, so to, to get um, any therapies um, approved in our rare disease really is a team effort. It's a team effort with my colleagues um, at the university specialty centers, but also in the private practices that was the nice thing about this trial. It was a really diverse group of um, centers that participated um, so that we made sure that we had a really good sampling of the wide you know, variety of early stage CTCL patients that are out there. Um, and then um, it requires partnership with a, a really dedicated um, uh, company. And I have to say Sologenics has been absolutely wonderful to work with because they are committed um, to the field, to patients, um, and uh, the um, not just the leadership, but their staff. The, they were the same when we started three years ago, and they've stuck with us, and that just shows true dedication. Um, so that's been really rewarding. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, clinical trials, it, it, it because CTCL is so rare, it takes a while to, to enroll the right patients. There's certain rules. Um, to enter. So this trial focused on early stage patients, stage 1A, 1B, and 2A, people who had patches or plaques, um, but no significant lymph node, blood, or internal involvement. Um, that doesn't mean that this treatment wouldn't help those patients eventually, but we didn't focus on that. Um, and then in terms of, um, it, it was a nice trial because it didn't really exclude um, other issues. So some trials, um, if you uh, had a, a past history of using a certain therapy, you wouldn't be allowed on the trial. You needed to have a washout period. Um, there was a washout period, but uh, this was a pretty welcoming trial and it was pretty open to a lot of different people. Um, the one interesting thing, which I always found amusing was um, you had to agree not to sunbathe, um, you know, while you were on trial. So, so that's an important thing when you enter a clinical trial. And I think many of you patients who are out there um, it is, as, as uh, Susan said, 
you know, there are rules and you kind of have to stick by the rules in a little bit more rigorous fashion than um, just regular treatments with your, your doctor. So it's been a great experience. I've been involved in lots of other clinical trials, um, both topical therapies and, um, and systemic therapies um, over the past 18 years at Penn. Um, and I really enjoy it. I'm, I'm so grateful that we can develop new therapies, even though this is a rare, rare disease. And this is a unique therapy. It has a, a unique niche um, because it's phototherapy, but there's also a topical agent. And if I had to say another advantage besides the decreased skin cancer risk um, and improved safety from that standpoint, the nice thing is you can target treatment. So phototherapy, you kind of treat your whole body and you do get tan. You do get tan with traditional phototherapy. With this, you do have to apply the topical agent. Um, so it's more focused. So then you kind of eliminate some of that more generalized tanning um, appearance that you might normally get um, from a, just an appearance standpoint. Um, so I think it, we like to have lots of tools in our toolbox um, to treat CTCL, and this is going to be a very valuable tool to have um, if everything continues um, as we expect. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, you know, and not to throw a little curveball, but um, as I as I was listening and I was thinking, um, so this is really, and you guys can answer or not, um, but you know, this is as I think about it from a patient perspective, you're using fluorescent lights versus UVB or UVA lights. So, um, and then the topical agent is applied to the skin. So you only need to apply it where you have the lesions. Um, and then the actual effect is only to the lesions, right? Not to other areas of the skin that may not be affected, which is kind of what you just said. Um, so were there any people on the trials that had uh, like more, I know you said, um, Dr. Poulian, that it was basically for the trial, it was three lesions that you um, treated to see and to do the baseline and to see how it reacted. But, you know, going forward, obviously people have maybe more than three lesions or more of their body surface. Do you see this being an effective treatment as well for people that have maybe a little bit more than just two or three lesions in their body with, you know, just thinking ahead of the curve of some people that um, will say, well, you know, how do I treat like more pieces of my body with the light? Right. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, and I'll let others chime in as well, but I, I certainly do. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, um, this is not unlike uh, many other topical therapies that, you know, your topical agents that don't involve light, uh, that they would be still applying a cream or a, an ointment uh, to, to their skin to, to cover the surface area. And indeed, I think the fact that, like I talked about before, in cycle three, we gave patients exactly that opportunity. And we said, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is something that you can, you can participate in that is, that is real world and it's completely up to you. And obviously, because 70% of the patients that were involved in the trial um, wanted to go forward and do that, there is, that, that points directly to the fact that, that the patients themselves feel there's a very, um, you know, real fit for that kind of disease. Um, I think just like anything, the more you have to do, um, the, the, the more hindrance there may be to comply. So if you had someone that had, you know, complete total coverage of their body, um, you know, a very extensive disease, they may choose to only treat portions of it with us and then portions of it, you know, with, with something yeah. else in the future or, or choose another therapy. But the majority of our early stage patients don't have that type of overwhelming um, involvement. And so this is a great, this is a great fit for them. Uh, exactly like Dr. Kim said, because you can target specifically where you want to, mm -hmm. where you want to have the drug effect and you only have the drug effect where you apply the drug. Um, and so I, th I think that's a unique uh, an advantage for us. And I'll, I'll let Rick and, uh, and Helen chime in if they have anything else to add there. Yeah, I think that um, one important aspect that we observed was the actual hyperosin ointment itself is not particularly irritating. And we were gratified to see that. So from a safety standpoint, um, uh, we have a long list of different topical agents that we use for CTCL. 
Um, they all have their benefits and, um, and side effects. Um, many of our, our topical treatments do have a primary irritant effect, um, just as nature of their, their, their chemical makeup. Um, so we, we, you know, we're aware of that and it may limit how much we, how much body surface area we can use it for, but hypericin really was quite well tolerated and it doesn't really have that primary irritancy effect. So it could be used on, on more body surface area than the initial three um, target lesions. Well, it's interesting. Boy, I wish, I wish something like this was available 30 years ago when I started with PUVA, which was the only light treatment. They didn't even have UVB and hence, you know, all of my lovely age spots that came out a little earlier than they should have. <laughs> but this is exciting. This is really exciting. So um, what kind of data are you able to share? I mean, I know this is, you're still, things are still in, uh, you know, you've finished the actual trial itself and data, and now you're crunching all those numbers and doing all of the analysis and things like that. But um, what what can you share with us? So we, we can share um, the cycle one and cycle two data, um, and uh, that was publicly announced. Um, so just uh, to, again, as a, an important reminder, we had the trial was really rigorous. It had a placebo arm, so we could really objectively um, compare the active treatment. Um, okay. so I need sound effects on the, in the background, on the train, and uh, and. And it was blinded. So I, as the investigator, did not know whether or not the patients I treated were had placebo or the active ingredient. And that's really important because um, that means that we remain objective, that when we do the disease assessments, we're doing it objectively and we're not swayed um, by the, you know, by knowing what, what we're treating with. So for cycle one, um, there was a, a strong statistically significant difference between the active arm, the, the hypericin arm, and the placebo arm. So after just six weeks of this photodynamic therapy, 16% um, of the sologenic of the hypericin treated patients had an objective response, which means they improved at least 50%. Um, their their uh, kales or skin score um, improved by at least 50%. And um, the placebo arm was 4%. So wow. um, this is a pretty early time point. I think most, um, most of my patients know that I always counsel them that this is a marathon, not a race, mm -hmm. or a sprint, not a sprint. And it takes a while to see effects um, from the vast majority of skin-directed therapy. So six weeks is a really early time point. But the, um, the p-value for those scientists out there was really uh, was 0.04. And it's, it, there was a definitive difference between um, the hypericin and the placebo. And then at, at the end of cycle two, so that's at the 12 week mark, so um, patients who received two cycles of active agent had a response rate of 40%. Um, and that was really gratifying to see. And that's right in line with many topical agents um, at that time point. Um, so um, we were very, very happy to see that. And especially since it was a blinded placebo controlled trial. And then the safety profile also was similar to previous studies. It was really well tolerated. Um, there were some cases of irritation or burning sensation or redness, but not nearly the same phototoxicity or the term we use for sunburn, sunburn reaction, or our major irritant or allergic dermatitis um, in terms of frequency and severity. We just didn't see that um, in, in this, at, at this time point so far. Oh, that's that's great because I know you know we get calls from folks when they a lot of folks not a lot but you know people when they begin phototherapy will say well my itching increased or my skin was really red and I got sunburn and you know and then that has a you know is this really can I how can I tell if this is working is this a, a supposed to happen or is this an adverse you know so so that's exciting to hear. It's, um, I, I think that, again, just emphasizing that the, the way this was constructed was in a really objective fashion. And it's hard to do because it's hard to tell a patient, well, you're going to have a placebo for six weeks. Yeah. Um, but thank you for, to, to my patients and all the patients who are willing to do this trial because it was done in a really, um, you know, sort of objective fashion. And so we can really rely on the data. Yeah, that's great. And that's, you know, again, going back to 
why clinical trials are so rigorous because we really need to have the data that can then be analyzed and and you can come out with conclusions that show whether this is a valuable treatment, is it safe, and all those things um, while you take it to the next level to be approved. So I guess, um, Dr. Straub, this comes over to you. So where do we go from here? Kind of the phase three trial has been closed, right? If, if I'm correct in that. So what, what happens next and what can we look forward to? Sure. Um, I think it's important to realize that the trial is ongoing. We have stopped enrollment. Most of the patients have finished all of their therapy. Um, cycle three just ended, uh, so we're beginning to look at that data. As you've heard from Dr. Kim, we are very pleased with the results to date. Um, the drug appears to be effective. Um, the acute safety profile seems to be very good, specifically compared to many of the other sorts of skin-directed therapy. The question now is what happens long-term um, to these patients? That we believe from the mechanism of action that this drug should be very safe um, long-term, but until we show that, it's just a belief as opposed to actual fact. So we are following patients for six months. Um, many of those patients still are being followed and we really appreciate the sort of effort that these patients are taking to sort of brave both the pandemic and the social unrest to come in and get clinic visits because this is going to be critical data to determine whether or not this drug is um, going to be long-term useful. So the last patient, last visit is going to be towards the end of this year. At that time, um, we will monitor all the data, get it clean, get it ready for analysis. At that point, we will let all of the physicians know what their patients got during cycle one. Um, every patient wants to know whether, how much they got. Uh, in some ways, it's nice in this trial because everyone who did at least two cycles know they got drug at least once, um, in some cases two or three times. So that um, Patients should be able to find out from the treating physician towards the end of the year, early next year, as to what they actually got. At that time, um, as a company, we will be writing up the clinical study report for submission to the FDA, um, and we will be working with the investigators uh, who did the trial uh, to make sure that this gets written up and put into a peer-reviewed medical journal. Um, that's a critical element of all clinical research. You do the trial, you analyze it, but you put it out so that the entire medical community can really assess um, what holes there may be in what you did um, and to let them know exactly what you did and did not see. When we submit um, to the FDA for approval to make the drug available uh, to patients, you put together something called a new drug application. This is um, a comprehensive dossier on everything you know about the drug, so that it's all the preclinical work, but also includes things like manufacturing. Um, and we're proving that commercially you can make drug which is as pure and as good as what we used in the clinical trial. Clinical trial obviously uses a small batch. As you expand, sometimes problems come up. Same way with the light device. Um, we have to prove that we meet all of the specifications which are constantly changing. So all of that has to be put together and put in dossier which then gets uh, sent to the FDA. One would imagine that this is a sort of medium-sized sort of thing in actuality. It's a huge amount of information. Usually there are tens of thousands of pages and back in the bad old days when we did this on paper, it took a literally a large panel truck just for all the copies that had to go down to the FDA. So we are, are going to be working on that obviously. Once it gets to the FDA, Typically, the FDA requires 12 months to review application to make a decision whether or not to get approved. 
Because CTCL is what's known as an orphan drug, we've been designated as having orphan drug status, which means that the FDA will um, sort of have special rules and try to do this review within six months. Um, sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't, especially in these days with COVID, um, they are backed up. We also expect that about the same time we're going to be putting our application, a number of the COVID drugs which have been pushed forward will also be under review. So how long it'll take the FDA is pure speculation, but we are moving that process along. In addition to that, Obviously, um, there are a number of other things that we are doing in parallel. First of all, we're working with um, all sorts of insurance companies, including Medicare, Medi-Cal, um, private payers, because we are well aware of the fact that a drug which you cannot afford to use is not particularly useful for most patients. So what we hope to do is be able to have all of that worked out at the time the drug actually becomes available. Um, there are also a number of other things that we will be doing. Um, certainly, as we move forward, we're looking to do a number of things to optimize how we actually use this drug. For example, we will be looking at some different formulations to see if they are more effective, less effective, and whether or not it is easier or harder for patients to actually use these different formulations to try to optimize that um, portion of this. In addition, as we move forward, we're looking to upgrade the light device to make it a little more user-friendly, um, and we'll take it from there. Both of these sorts of upgrades, if you will, to the current therapy, they're not necessary for approval, but we think that this is important to make this as easy for patients as possible. And they will require small clinical trials to prove that these changes do or don't help. Um, and so we're looking at that. We also have a number of our investigators, including Dr. Kim, who has pointed out that although we have enough data, we believe, to prove that the drug is efficacious and well tolerated, there is not necessarily all the information that a clinician would like to have to decide how to actually use this drug. Um, as we've mentioned several times in this panel, we are using a very strict protocol which treats for cycles of six weeks. In the real world, that's not how patients are treated. So what we will be doing is working with some of the investigators um, to put together trials which do a much more real world application to see how long you can give this drug and still see beneficial effects. We know from six weeks to 12 weeks, and we're hopeful at the end of cycle um, three at 18 weeks, we will continue to see more improvement, but how long is long enough? And is the safety profile that we anticipated actually going to happen? So with all of these, we probably will be doing a, a number of clinical trials um, obviously, a lot of that's dependent on funding and the fact that people can actually get back to a new normal. Um, but um, we are hopeful that we can have the support from both the uh, investigators, the patients, and the CLF um, that we've really had the benefit of uh, in this phase three trial. So all in all, um, we're very, very hopeful that we will be able to, in the near future, be able to offer this therapy to um, patients. And hopefully, um, we can work with people to optimize how best to use this and add it as uh, another weapon in, in your armamentarium. Yeah, that's really great. And I, I, I so appreciate the whole conversation because I think you know, as a lay person, as a patient, even someone, if you've been engaged in the clinical trial, you know, you're, you, you're finished, you're done your, your part, and then you don't hear anything. And then maybe a couple years later, all of a sudden, oh, I was part of that clinical trial, and now I can actually get the therapy. Or, you know, no, we don't often, as lay people, get a glimpse into the, kind of the behind the scenes of what really happens 
um, not only the nuts and bolts of the trial itself, but you know, in this gap time, what's really going on, um, all the work that needs to get done both to prepare the process for the FDA to review, but then, you know, what happens, you know, what's that timeline for the FDA? And now we're in this whole crazy time of COVID. So who knows what those impacts are going to be on these kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, as assuming you get an approval, again, as you've mentioned, it's, it's based on the, the structure and the rigor that was required for the clinical trial. So now you have an opportunity to test it in the real world and to gather more data on, um, you know, how does this function in the real world? How do we really apply it? And all those kinds of questions that I think everybody's always asking, how long should you stay on treatment? Can you take a break? How long is the time frame from when you may stop treatment to maybe, you know, because we know the disease kind of ebbs and flows and it depends on the individual patient and how they respond to a treatment. And so, you know, I, I know Dr. Kim, that's always been a big question in the clinical community and, and probably some debate. Like, so even for, for phototherapy as we use it today, when do you do you discontinue? Do you go on maintenance? What does that look like? And we have to start, we have to capture that data. So these follow-up clinical trials and studies that try to gather that kind of data are so important, right? To help um, quantify how people can be treated in real life. And, and I know those are always a lot of questions from, from the patient community that occur and it's like, well, why should I, should I stay on treatment? Do, what, can I take a break? You know, and, and the data is so critical in order to make good decisions. Yeah, like one really simple question is, well, what if we try treating three times a week instead of twice a week? I mean, it's, I think we pick twice a week because that's what the phase two did. And, you know, it's, we make a lot of decisions based on just historical reasons. And also we want to you know, make it easier on the patient, but right. there are a lot of variables to treatment um, and both active treatment and maintenance treatment um, that can affect, you know, um, time to response, duration of response, side effect profile. So those are all really all very interesting and important questions that these observational kind of um, uh, like phase four studies that are really play an important role. So I, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that Sologenics is willing to to um, devote time and energy to, to those studies because they'll provide good information. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's good for patients to understand too, like, well, I thought this was an approved treatment. It, the clinical trial finished up, what do you mean? There's another opportunity, but well, what, why would I participate in this clinical trial for something that's already av available? And, and it's because we have to gather all this additional data in more of a real world setting and and um, and that really can help pinpoint the best way and the best treatment approach um, for patients. So I, I want to be um, aware of everybody's time and I know we only have a couple of minutes here left but we had some a few questions um, from folks so I thought if we could we could address a couple of these um, while we're here. So, and this one might be appropriate for Dr. Kim. Um, someone asked, how do you know if you have early stage disease? And then they kind of followed up with, um, is the trial going on in multiple locations? So, um, I don't know if you want to take one or both, or I can toss the other over to, to Chris or Rick. Yeah, sure. So, um, so early stage um, is defined as stage 1A, 1B, and 2A. And um, that translates into patients who have mycosis fungoides patches or plaques. Um, and that's less than 80% of your body surface area um, and no significant um, lymphoma in lymph nodes, blood or internal organs. Um, so that's about 70% of the MF population falls into early stage. Then there's the, the issue, your stage of diagnosis. So that's really your stage with a capital S. Um, 
And then there's your stage at trial entry. So there are some patients who, um, you know, might be initially stage 1B, but then their current stage or their stage at trial entry is stage 1, 1A. Uh, but your doctor will be able to tell you what your original stage was and what current stage um, is right now. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, so as, as was mentioned by, um, by Chris, uh, this was a multi-center trial. It took place in the U.S. only. Um, there were 30 centers and academic centers and then more sort of smaller, more community-based centers. Um, but all these centers obviously took care of um, TCL patients in their daily practice. Um, and it was limited to early stage patients, um, but it was uh, centers throughout the country. Great, great. And then, and I think you talked a little bit about this, that um, someone asked, how did you qualify to participate? And I think, you know, you mentioned a little bit about this was maybe unique in a lot of clinical trials where there wasn't a lot of um, exclusion criteria, which typically happens Yes, because I think um, we're, we're looking at using this as one of the upfront therapies, one of the initial therapies after diagnosis. Um, you had to have at least three lesions. So I did have a few patients who had two lesions and they couldn't enter the trial. Um, so, so that was one criteria and you had to be early stage um, and, uh, you know, no known history of, of like allergy to the, you know, to the hypericin. But otherwise, it was a pretty, um, the, there weren't too many requirements. Excellent, excellent. So someone wrote in and said that uh, they completed, completed their trial about two years ago and the positive effects seem to be continuing. Uh, how long have hypericin effects been lasting overall? And, and I'm guessing that's partially some of the data you're crunching now, right, Chris? But um, I don't know if there's anything that you can share or, or things that you've learned. Uh, yeah, sure. So first off, that's great to hear. And first, thank you for your participation in the trial. And second, I'm glad to uh, hear that you've had such a great response and it's continuing. Um, again, like we talked about from a trial design standpoint, our follow-up period is six months. So when we're done, the six-month follow-up period, we'll be able to tell you exactly how patients do for six months, right? Mm -hmm. um, anything past that, we kind of get into the space where we're a little bit anecdotal. Um, and, and that's another reason why over the years as this, um, you know, gets approved, gets developed, uh, it'll continue to get studied for, for things just like that to answer your question succinctly. I can tell you anecdotally that, um, you know, I've seen and met many of the patients that are in our trial um, and reviewed all their cases. Um, we have several patients that are very similar to you in regards to um, how they're responding, uh, how long they've had responses for years. I was with uh, Dr. Brian Polygon in Barcelona. He's actually one of the principal investigators at our site in Rochester that uh, he's our lead enroller in the study. He enrolled the most patients in the trial. He had a particularly difficult patient who had a subtype of disease, folliculotropic mm -hmm. mucosis fungoides, um, as, as you guys uh, may be familiar with that term. They, uh, they got treated and they stopped their treatment about four years ago. They've been cleared for about four years now. Um, in, in their disease where the areas were treated with uh, high Paris. And so um, that is probably about as long as I can tell you anecdotally again, I want to stress that it's not, it, there's a difference between having analyzed data that is part of a subset of the trial that's follow up, right? And then what we're hearing from investigators that participate in the trial around the world. We know that these trials, uh, that these patients were in the study, we know that they got the drug and we know that they're still having an effect. And the effect ranges. I mean, some people mm -hmm. did very well for a period of months. Other people are still doing well for a couple of years. And then, sure, there's a couple of people that it didn't work that well for, and they're going to try um, something else. So it really kind of, uh, it runs the gamut. But your individual case is not unusual. It is not rare. It is something that is uh, that we are hearing about and all of our different physicians around the country are reporting to us. That's great. And again, that goes back to those follow-up studies that we can capture that longer-term data and start to pull those trends and understand yeah. how that might impact. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also important just to highlight, I mean, I didn't want to chime in too much on that, but, um, you know, we've done what we needed to do from a regulatory standpoint, we believe right now, to go with the new drug application, as Rick has already outlined, um, for approval for this drug. That doesn't mean you stop research and development. I mean, to be an effective 
um, service for the community as a whole and as your patients, you always want to make what you're um, developing better. And you always want to learn more information about what you're attempting to provide to your patients. So it's not like we just sit around and type papers all day for the next, you know, uh, year or so while we're putting in a new drug application. No, we go to the leaders of the field and we say, hey, listen, you guys liked this. Um, this worked for your patients. How can we make it better? What else can we do? What else would you like to know? Um, we know that the phase two study, for example, was positive in psoriasis. Should we be looking at patients that also have psoriasis uh, in a, in a follow-on study to see what that looks like? Um, there's a lot of different avenues that we can go from this. This isn't the end-all and be-all clinical trial. This is this is the clinical trial that that shows us that this drug works, that leads us down the path of a new drug application, so that we can get this to patients hopefully as 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 fast as humanly possible, and then you know leads to further development um, and research. And so I, I think that's that's really key to remember because it's really kind of like two different things uh, that we're talking about that you do on parallel paths. Um, uh, that ultimately, hopefully, lead to great results for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah, which and I, I think, you know, everybody thinks that the actual clinical trial process prior to uh, FDA approval, at least here in the U.S., that's like the be-all, end-all, but really, that's almost like the beginning. It's like you have to get through that part, and then and then you can really start to learn more about how the drug works, how to use it in real life, what, what is the long-term impact, collecting all of that kind of data. You can really begin to collect quality of life data and all of those things, which is so important in our disease, given that it's, you know, it's chronic. Um, we know most people are in and out of treatment or in treatment most of the time. So the more things that we can have in our armamentarium and the more information and data we have to better uh, find ways of treating an individual, giving our clinicians the tools to be able to work with all of us that are patients to say, well, this is what we know. This is what we know about you. Let's figure out the best approach and the best treatment plan. So this is kind of a, you know, we're waiting for that magical moment, but then it's really what comes next. It's, that's really exciting. Sorry, yeah, I, I'm probably I babbling. <laughs> Yeah, and just uh, one other thing on that. I mean, you know, mission one, obviously, get this over the finish line as soon as we possibly can, right? I mean, if, now that we know we are, have demonstrated a drug effect, we want to get, uh, just like Rick said, through the steps of the NDA um, as, as fast as, as humanly possible, as, as to complete a package um, so that we can hopefully ultimately get that um, new drug approval. Um, the other thing that's, in, that's important to focus on is that Right now, like Alan said earlier, we're a frontline therapy. I mean, one of the reasons that the protocol inclusion and exclusion X criteria was designed the way it is, is that this is something that we believe can be one of the first treatment approaches, if not the first treatment approach that patients are going to get. I understand most of you probably spent several years before you were um, diagnosed with CTCL. That's really common, right? We know it's somewhere between five and seven years, the average patient. Um, takes before they can get diagnosed. And so many of you have already tried topical steroids or something like that before you see an expert like Dr. Kim to, to make a definitive diagnosis. But right in line with that, um, we don't anticipate having any restrictions on us um, that, that would prohibit us from being a first line therapy uh, once we get approval. That is definitely something that we're going for. And it's important to remember that most of the other therapies that are used right now don't have that same um, you know, indication. They, they're either not approved and they're used off-label, or they, they need to be, you know, technically as far as the label goes, they have to have failed another therapy before they're able to be um, administered. And so that's just one more reason why we're, we're working as hard as we can to, to, to be effective and get that new drug application rolling and processed so that hopefully we can, you know, get this out as, as quick as possible. Yeah, no, and I think that's a good point because that then ties back into, in, in the U.S. at least, um, insurance coverage and access to a therapy like this. If, if the actual label that gets approved by the FDA says it's first line, you don't have to fail a, another treatment before you can begin this. And um, I know that many people, you know, our insurance system is so complicated, but one of the things 
that can be a barrier is if the label doesn't have it, that it's the first line treatment and you have to fail a number of other treatments that then not only did it take you maybe five years to get a proper diagnosis for a variety of reasons, but now you have to go on something that may not be as effective in order to have it be covered by your insurance company. So, so this again, it's a, it's a little different piece, but that's also another area that you're uh, really working on kind of parallel to all of the, the data and the clinical trial component is looking at uh, making sure that, that things are accessible. And, and um, you know, one of the other challenges we have is using things off label creates a hurdle as well, both for access or, um, you know, sometimes there are issues around, um, you know, treatments that, that then are no longer. I know back in the day when I was on some, some topicals, they kind of disappeared from the market, but it wasn't an approved drug for our disease. So, you know, we, we had no options. Anyway, I could ramble forever. Um, let me go back to some of our questions here. So as I know, we only have a few more minutes. Um, question about the fluorescent light treatments, a safer option for people with cutaneous lymphoma who have had melanoma in the past. And I think we touched on this a little bit, but perhaps um, specifically for people with, with melanoma, a mel concurrent melanoma diagnosis. It's probably Dr. Kim to you. Yeah, so I, um, that is probably the, the um, most notable um, aspect of this therapy um, is that it that there is no increased risk in skin cancer or, or melanomas with long therapy with um, hypericin and uh, fluorescent light. Um, so, of course, we do need long-term data, and Rick mentioned this, we always want to be careful, um, but so far, at least based on the mechanism of action, um, this would be a safe therapy um, for somebody with a history of melanoma. That's good. That's very good. Um, okay, so our next question here is, uh, is this treatment delivered in a doctor's office, or will there be an option for home units? And I know, Rick, you kind of alluded to some of those things that you're looking at going forward, you know, which will be down the road, but um, anything that you might be able to share along those lines? Sure. Uh, we will be limited for the initial um, approval of the drug with the light delivered exactly the way it was in the clinical trial. So when this first comes out, this will be limited to doctor's offices, just like it was in the clinical trial. We certainly have heard from both physicians as well as patients that coming into a doctor's office two, three times a week for prolonged periods is a barrier. And so we are working very closely with our light manufacturer to come up with options that could be used at home. Again, mm -hmm. that will have to be approved by the FDA. Um, just like drugs, the FDA requires a medical device to go through very rigorous sort of testing. Um, and because it's at home use, you have to have a number of safeguards built into the machine, et cetera. But one of the advantages we have is that this is essentially fluorescent light. Anyone who works in an office sits under a fluorescent light eight hours a day. So we know that it's reasonably safe so that we think that transition will happen a lot sooner and a lot safer than it would for a number of the other therapies that use some sort of ultraviolet. Mm, good to know. I think that wraps us up and we're like a minute past. So thank you all so much for joining us. I, I think this was a great discussion and we'll be in touch, hopefully, as we hit the next round of milestones and do another update. Um, and in the meantime, we'll just uh, keep on going and know that you guys are working hard to, uh, to take this to the, next, to the next level. So really appreciate you kind of giving us an inside, inside look into what's happening. And, uh, and I think a lot of hope for patients that there's another treatment modality coming down um, the line in the not too distant future, at least we're all keep our fingers crossed on that. So I will, uh, again, thanks, you, thanks 
everyone for joining us. And I'll turn it back over to Hillary to finish us up with some announcements. Thanks, Susan. And just to echo Susan, thank you all for your time and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. We really, we really appreciate it. Um, just before we sign off here, I just wanted to um, let everybody know about our next event. It's going to be Thursday, June 18th at 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, and Monica Bryant of the Triage Cancer Center is going to be discussing uh, advocacy and awareness. So just the importance of your voice, advocating for yourself, for other individuals in the community, um, helping a friend or family member through their diagnosis, um, and also advocating for new or changed uh, legislation or propositions. So it's going to be really informative. If you're interested, sign up, join us. And with that, we're going to sign off here. Thank you for spending part of your Tuesday with us. Be well, and we will hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>